Welcome to DroneCast, rethinking public safety one drone at a time, a podcast by DroneSense. We explore real-world applications of drones in emergency response, offering a close examination of evolving trends in drone technology and its impact on public safety. Welcome back to DroneCast, rethinking public safety one drone at a time. I'm your host, Joe Kearns. And if you're just joining us, we're in the middle of a fascinating two-part conversation with Coy Kessler, a veteran firefighter and drone expert. In part one, we explored the evolution of drone use in firefighting and its current applications. Now in part two, we're looking into the future and we'll discuss the impact of drones in different firefighting scenarios, the challenges and limitations of current technology and existing developments on the horizon. So let's jump right back into our conversation with Coy Kessler. Now, a couple of good questions for you. What is the impact of drones in rural versus urban firefighting scenarios? Do they serve different purposes depending on the environment? Is this a combination of just of not only drone, other technology? How do they all kind of come together? I don't think there's that much of a difference. I always like to joke about, I say it's a stupid piece of plastic that brings us all together. Right. It's this piece of plastic in there is gathering all this information. So if you're gathering information in a rural environment, we have challenges that are different. So maybe I'm have, I don't have enough uh, data because I'm flying out too far or in your situation, I'm in the mountains and I'm challenged by topography. But in the metro world, our guys over on the East coast with FDNY in Boston, they have a lot of the same similarities. In fact, because they have too much RF interference. They have, their challenges are big buildings in front of them where you have a mountain, they got a building. Urban jungle, right? And then actual jungle. Yeah, it's the urban jungle. Urban canyons are even a, a thing. So as you're flying through the city and you've got the wind that's pushing through, that creates vortices that we end up cha- being challenged with. So, you know, it's there's a lot more similarities and there are differences, but it looks very different. Building versus mountain. But when it comes down to it, you always go high, as high up in that mountaintop as you can to get good RF. You go as high as you can on top of a building. Like the guys in FDNY, they'll actually go on top of buildings. They'll go up to the whatever height, 51st floor, take an elevator to the top, and then they will pull the drones out and launch from there because they need to try to overcome the challenges that they, they have with the environments they work in. But no, a lot of similarities, the jobs... You know, the job is gathering information and making good decisions from it. All right, Coit. So I want to ask a few questions about training and maybe uh, skill development in there. And I I know you've handled this a lot and you've held this in in a a lot of different ways, especially as a customer success uh, manager and such. How do firefighters get trained to operate drone technology? And what skills are the most important in piloting them during emergencies? So I'm going to definitely answer that, but I'm going to go a little, I'm going to go a little around it. I'm going to say whatever we do, what I'm about to answer here on the drone side is the exact same answer that I would give you if you said, how would you train to become a firefighter? Or how would you train to become a police officer? It's actually the same thing in that we do the initial training and we have to meet a standard. So our initial training at drones is, is part 107. That is our initial, for, for public safety, I believe that's very important that you meet the, the minimum requirements set forth by the FAA. So we get the part 107 done. And then from there, we've got to we got to expand on that. So the team that I had come from, we had a, a 40, business 40 plus hour uh, week that started you off. No different than the fire academy that I went through. My fire academy was, I mean, it was, you know, six months versus a week, but I had a basic level of training that I had to go through. So we go, we put our people through a basic level of training. And then once you meet that, now you start specializing. And once you get done with specializing, so I come from a special operations background, on the fire side, so I've got to get, I've got to be on good on ropes. I've got to be good at diving. I've got to be good in case, blah, 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 blah. On drones, I've got to get specialized on thermography. I've got to get specialized on search and rescue. I've got to be good at flying indoors. I've got to be good at mapping. I've got to be good at blah, 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 blah. So it's kind of the same thing. It's your basic level of training. It's getting specialized. And then you've got to circle back and get currency. Now the currency part is very important. We use NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. That is built into our basic level of training. So when you finish your one week RPIC course to make you a baby RPIC, you have to go through the NIST aerial test methods, right? We, we want to make sure that you can meet that. Every year, you're going to have to follow back up. And we need to make sure that you got flight hours, 
that you're getting your hours logged. You got time underneath the belts. You, you're familiar with the software you're using, you're familiar with the drones you're using, but you also got to meet currency. And that just quant coincidentally is exactly what manned aviation does. So the FAA says you have to maintain three takeoffs, three landings every 90 days. They have a minimum requirement. You set a minimum requirement for your department. You have to meet an annual certification. We have an annual certification that you have to meet. So it's, it's really no different than everything else we do in the fire service or public safety. It's just doing it with a, a stupid piece of plastic in the air. I love it. I'm always going to keep that title of a stupid piece of plastic. I'll never get away from me. When they say, hey man, when they become metal or some other tech or piece of material, you're going to be change, change your term, or maybe that should be your call sign or tattoo you'll get some time to talk further even on on like training and such are there any major challenges or learning curves in adopting this technology within the fire department and as you were saying it's a it's very similar across but let's just focus on fire fighting what i'm about to say for firefighting could be used for law enforcement could be used for management emergency medical it doesn't same thing for firefighting i've got to be i have to be a general practitioner as a firefighter I have to understand building construction. I have to understand medicine, emergency medicine, right? I've got to be able to understand basic hazmat, blah, 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 blah. There's all these different things that I have to be able to understand. And then when you specialize, so I was in special operations, I had to get good at ropes and good at diving and swift water and blah, all those things. And now you're going to add in drones oh, or robots. That's a lot. So I've got a brain of a Labrador. And that's put, and that'd probably be generous. So I'm doing everything I can to keep all this in my head and be good at what, at all these different jobs. And it's so hard because I also have to know, like when the tone goes off, I've got to go respond and run a pit crew operation for CPR, or I've got to be able to go cut a hole in a roof or tie a, an anchor so my team can go over an edge and rescue somebody. I mean, it's just like all this different information. And now I've got to pull out my drone and also send it down the river to go look for somebody and then be able to communicate what I'm seeing back. And then I've got to know what happens when my battery is low and, oh, there's a helicopter coming over. What do I do then? Who do I talk to? Like there's just all this information in flying drones for public safety, flying drones for emergency response is only one small part of it. This is only one very small part of being a firefighter, very small part. So, you know, as we evolve and our culture changes and this becomes a position this becomes something that you do fdny is doing a great job they have people that are out doing this full time that's their job they drive robotics full time when we evolve to that position we've gone over the next big hurdle but right now our guys we're asking everybody to do everything and man it's, it's a lot it's a whole lot is there a constant place to to gather all this information is it just those that are operating in, in, in this need to be constantly updated or seeking knowledge at all times? What does that look like? Is there a community in there? Is there a place that happens that those in the fire department or public safety in general can go to to find some of this information, maybe a working group? So I will definitely circle back to our working group because that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak directly to. But I, I want to make sure that I also share the love with the Law Enforcement Drone Association, LIDA. I want to share the love with the Airborne Public Safety Association, APSA. I want to share love with drone responders and everything that Charles Werner is doing. I want to share the love with all these other organizations that are trying to pull us together. NIST is doing a fantastic job with tying us all together. It's very important that we all communicate. We are very lucky in Drone Sense in that every Friday, every Friday we have a working group that we're able to have people come on. And it's, that's what I always, when I'm talking to somebody that's just coming into our, into drone sense, I'm like, hey guys, congratulations, you just bought some software. But let me tell you what you really got. And that's when we go into it and we say, listen, this is about community. I'm gonna make sure you have my phone number saved in your phone. Oh, and people call me all the time, right? But you're gonna have my phone number because you you may be in the back of an MRAP. You may be on the back in a wildland call. You may be at a flood. I want, if you're having an operational problem, I want you to have a human being that can, you can talk to help. I then want you to be able to come to our basic training work groups every other Wednesday, show up on every other Wednesday so we can go over basic training with us. I want you to know that we have this wonderful YouTube channel that has all this great information on it. You have the resources to, to be able to see and learn. 
I want you to be able to know that you can go to support about drone sense and you can get all this information all written out. I want you to know that there's a 1833 number you can call and speak to an American that answers the phone 24 hours a day to help you. And I want you to come every Friday to our working group so you have a sense of community. So you can mix it up if you're on the East Coast or the West Coast. We're all talking the same language. It doesn't matter if you're a cop, you're a medic, you're a firefighter, or emergency manager. It doesn't matter. It's that we're all getting together and we're all sharing information. You get to hear from our engineers. We get to hear from you. We get to know what your problems are and we get to help hopefully come up with solutions. That community, congratulations, that's what you just bought. And that is the love and that's the message here. That's what we really have got to do is just keep bringing ourselves together in, as a community. That's what human beings are really good at doing. And public safety is even better at it as with an organization. And that's the, the key to success with this going forward into the future. So now, if say I was just starting a drone program or, or I was just, just getting started with all of this and I wanted to understand more in the regulatory space and understand from no sp fly zones, what's a COA, all this kind of stuff. This is a great place to learn this. And then could you expand on even in more what it's like navigating that world from your perspective? Yeah, it's full of suck. It, and it has been for a long time. It's so much better than it is now than it was in 2014 when we started. I mean, it's exponentially better. But yeah, it sucks. It sucks. The strength that we have is in community. So if you're showing up at a conference, and you go meet blah, 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 or you go meet blah, 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 and you're able to connect, that community building is really where it's at. Because I may be coming from a metropolitan department and need to know the challenges that another metropolitan department has. So I'm going to get a hold of the Metro guys, right? I'm going to, I'm going to FDNY. It's going to be Mike, Fred, Andrew, John. I know who to call. I'm going to go out to the West Coast. Man, I'm getting my butt handed to me with wildland urban, urban interface and wildfires. We'll call all the Cal Fire homies up. I'm going to get a hold of Jeff Pritchard. Pete York and Jeff Pritchard are going to be my guys to call immediately. I'm going to know who's with NIST. I think it's really about building out that contact list, going to the right places to meet each other. And I'm going to tell you right now, come to our Drone Sense working group. That's where a lot of these guys are at, which is awesome. And then if they're not there, somebody on that group knows somebody else. So if you have a problem with BV loss and you want to learn about part 108, you get Brandon Carr a call. Everybody knows that. Brandon happens to be on our call. I mean, that's the dude that's behind all this. Where did Brandon Carr learn these things and who did he reach out to? But didn't he call you up to ask some questions on this? I never met Brandon. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it. It's all about us all working together. It really is. I was very fortunate to have, as I mentioned, Gene Robinson, my mentor. And, and to be able to see what Gene did for all of us and all of us being able to do that for others. That's the, the game is just give it all away, share it all. Community, continue with community, all about the community. Another facet of situational awareness, right? Let's shift gears a little bit here and maybe talk about even maybe some more in-depth things about like technology and innovation, if you're comfortable with. I'm curious your perspective on, uh, you know, are there are the limitations to the current technology we're using right now? Like, I mean, you're talking like, you know, using an, uh, a Phantom 1. Where are we now and the current limitations of the technology that exists today in either drone tech or software or so on, or possibly even the regulatory thing here and so on, and what that, that geopolitical landscape's like? What are the limitations with this technology and what would you like to see improved for firefighting? So currently, we do have. We have the political side of our limitations and the threat of limitations being tragic for the public safety. We saw what happened in Florida. We've seen what's happened in some other states. We cannot allow the, the choice of the use of aircraft and use of technology to be brought down upon us. That is the limit of choice is it has been shown throughout history to just literally take the legs out of civilization. So, I, it is, it is a for real problem. And we have a threat that has been upon us for a while. And by reducing that, the ability to have choice is so dangerous for us in public safety. We're really counting on American innovation coming up. We're very, we're counting on the, the U S being able to create products 
that can compete with the Chinese, that can compete with the drones that are out there. And that's what we're all rooting for. Today, we're limited by best-in-class technology being from China. And that is just the, that is a for real talk. Everybody knows it. And removing that is a real, that is a for real challenge to us. And I pray that choice is not taken away from public safety because we cannot afford to, with your tax money, to be able to do what, what is, what we may be being told to do, which is getting rid of the, our, our drones and having to buy things that uh, cost a lot more. So that is the political side. Quite, are there any limitations to current technology that you're using right now in firefighting that you would like to see improved to help or to add more value to, to expand, to help mitigation? What are your thoughts? So I just got back from a, a large extra scale exercise up in uh, Newark. It was up with FDNY, NYPD, and Officer Emergency Management. And challenges we were having, data. It's getting data from one place to another. It's making sure that we have our systems are able to get the right amount of information to the right people for good decision making. And that is challenging. I was in the subways of New York, and you don't think that's a tough environment, being subterranean, sub T, pushing data through. And that's not where the exercise took place at. But be thinking, like, okay, can our technology, if I can put a drone through a subway tunnel, am I going to get anything out of it? With the magnetic interference, with the communication challenges with bouncing RF around, how far can I put it in? What can I see when I'm in there? Because do I, do I have a good lighting package on a, a drone that's scaled to be able to fly through a, a tunnel? So there, there are challenges that, are, that we're seeing with this technology. However, we're seeing so much really cool advancement at the same time. The things that we can do today versus what we used to be able to do with our other drones, are it's just mind-blowing. Being able to take these drones out, I, I mentioned I was just in up in New York, trying to get information back to our incident command, but also being able to take the, all the imagery that our guys in North Carolina are gathering right now. I just got off the phone with one of our guys. He's one of our friends from our working groups. And I was just speaking to him. He's like, yeah, I've got 40, 40 plus gigs of data I got to send up to the cloud and my Starlink's not giving it to me. No, your Starlink doesn't do that. You know, and he knows that he's a smart engineer. So he has to go somewhere to drop that off. So that data, figuring out the challenges of the data is also a real challenge, right? Our guys in FDNY, they, one of the guys was flying at a, at a high rise last week, 51st floor window broke out and he's putting his drone up in the rain in Manhattan and over 55th floor. And, you know, he's got Manhattan's cars everywhere. So they got to block off the, the roadway and be able to communicate, make sure the wind doesn't blow his drone into the windows, make sure that the GPS is going to hold its position in that urban canyon with all that radio interference going back and forth. So I think we're getting to the point, though, that we're seeing this technology come around. I'm so thankful to work for our company, Joe, and that I feel like we listen to our customers and we build for the problems that we have. And I think that some of our vendors and some of our hardware manufacturers are doing the same. And it's really encouraging to see like somebody listening going, yeah, that 320 resolution IR camera that the military said they need it, it's not really enough for you guys, is it? No, it's not. I don't need to see a hot body so I can drop, a, drop an ordinance on them. I need to see a hot body and see how many are there and if they're waving their hands and where they're located. I need to have some definition. So I think we're, we're getting there, but we're, we really do have, we have some neat opportunities ahead of us with this. DFR, and for us with DroneSense, DroneSense is remote, is a great technology that we are rapidly running down the road with, and we're doing a great job. Now it's like, hey, how do we get these drones out and make sure that they, you know, they, they follow terrain and that they, that we don't bump into any buildings and that we are getting that information back, you know, and it's, it's timely, like all that. And I, if I'm so proud of our engineering team, because they just crush on this so hard, but like this, the technology, this is the next evolution for this is making things that are appropriate for our space, our world. Now we've always, we're talking a lot about drones and such, and drones are, you know, obviously bread and butter and, and kind of what we're, you know, drone sense, drone, so on. Drones are such a big part of this now. What other technologies, say ROVs, or as you and I geek on a lot, quadrupeds, 
How would that, what is that like bringing that kind of technology into the space, helping, or what do you see the future of it uh, being used? So I mentioned DFR being the next evolution. I got to be careful. I shouldn't make that. I shouldn't just use DFR. I want to, I'm going to say teaming as well. The team sport. Teaming is also the next big leap for us. So it's humans working with machines and machines working with other machines. That's kind of this next big step. In the military, we've been working on this puzzle piece for a while. You know, it's how can I take a, a person that in 2014 was using a, a Phantom 1 with a Bluetooth phone to control this drone. How can I take that one person and now control 50 vehicles and be able to use having those vehicles be able to have an algorithm that provides information back. So they do everything else. They don't bump into walls. They know when to come back to get batteries. They know it's how to take our equipment and get them to work together and how to maximize our potential on an emergency scene. Using our maximizing that potential could be a quadruped. In fact, it's going to be a quadruped. It's going to be a quadruped moving itself into a subway tunnel. It's going to be moving itself into a crash. It's going to be running a perimeter round for security along with a drone that launches off the top of it and can go over an area that the quadruped cannot get to, right? It, that quadruped can be the base station that charges that drone. That quadruped is a tool that can work with the tool to get the information back to the human being that can make good decisions, or perhaps the human being plus a machine that can help make good decisions. Teaming, teaming's the term that, that I love this. This is great. Teaming's a term. It's drones working with helicopters. Helicopters out running it. Drones out there running. Right now, we're doing it with the VHF radio. They can be doing some things together. It can be, right now, we have ADS-B that keeps airplanes away from other AD, air, the aircraft. We need to be, need to make remote ID something that's actually works well, that we can communicate and we can work around our, our helicopter. So it's teaming. That's the next, that's going to be the, the, one of the next big leaps for us. Something you and I have, I have spoken about here at Drone Senses, we've talked about having it across every element, like air, land, and sea. We see that kind of coordination coming together. Yeah, it's there today. It's just, it's not in practice the way that it will be. I was just watching a DJI fly cart dropping an ROV into a, a water treatment facility. So it was picked it up. It's in Edmonton, Canada. Picked up the ROV, flew it over to the water treatment facility. And then lowered it down off of its, off of its wedge, lowered it into the water, not dropped it, lowered it into the water and then took off and deployed. And the fly cart went off to go do other things. Same thing. If we're talking about, you know, move, it's, it's just, it's just these machines working with one another and then all that information coming in to make good decisions. Now we're speaking a lot about hardware and concepts. What do you, with emerging technologies, what about AI? And this concept, I know the hot topic and word right now, do you see that helping firefighting in certain ways or not just yet? Yeah, I absolutely. So I think we're kind of already using a lot of it with when we're looking at weather. The prevention side of things? Yeah, exactly. So let's take the, the latest hurricane that just hurt our, our communities over on the, the east side of our country. We were monitoring all that information. So there's all this information coming in from all the satellites for the NOAA. Um, sensors, like there's all this information coming in through, through various inputs. And then that has to be processed. Now a human being can absolutely process it, but the machines can process it faster. So AI, I do think that is something that is going to be a, a big player here as we, we move forward. I, I hope that we're able to keep the human in the loop because I think that we can work faster and stronger together. There's a lot of things that this monkey can do that a a supercomputer can't today. So us pairing our strengths and being able to work together is really the, I think that the big game, I'll just use like, and there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people trying to run into, have robots go into buildings and look for victims. I say, why? Because these hands work really well. My elbows work really well. My shoulders work well. My legs work well. But if you can give me something that I can process faster with, if you can track me, so if I get lost or a building falls on top of me, something collapses on top of me, and you can triangulate where I'm at and get me out faster. If we can use machines in those ways where we can work together, then 
I think that is where we start really picking up some speed with technology. And we look at the machines teaming with machines in different ways. There's another real-time crime center is a big thing right now. And using Fusis or Fluck or so on. All these kind of emerging technology right now. How does that relate in the fire service? Yeah, that's actually great. You mentioned the flock cameras, the fuchsia systems, the ability for us to rapidly gather information, just collate that information, sort that information, and then act upon it is what these systems are doing, right? So they're just, they're just gathering large amounts of information and the machines in our real-time crime centers are helping process that information. And... You know, it's really neat to, to be in one of those buildings and walk, look at the analysts. The analysts are kind of sitting around hanging on. You all of a sudden you hear, ding, and there's some sort of notification goes off. And, oh, there's a license plate, a license plate reader, LPR, that comes up. And you can look up and go, oh, that is somebody that's supposed to be paid attention to for whatever reason. And now where are they going? Oh, now I have an idea. Oh, wait a minute. They're at a place where my drone can launch and help get over the top of, oh, wait a minute. And when that drone's over the top, that feed can get back down on my officers that need to go talk to that person that just went there. And that all happened when that ding happened and the machine said, go. And now we have somebody that's flying the drone over and now we can get that information to the officer or the firefighters that have, there's a smoke detection device. It just, the, the camera picked up some sort of color pattern for smoke detection. It is found. A, and we have, th these cameras exist today in our wildland areas. And so now we need to get a, a device over the top of it to look for that lightning strike that took, took place or over the building that just caught on fire. And we want the drone as a first responder to be able to get over, give a situational awareness. Jeff Pritcher up in Oregon just did really good. I mean, he had this great response. And if that hadn't happened, like if he hadn't gone there, and it's really cool when you watch his drone flying in, you don't see any smoke, Joe. Like there's no smoke, but he had an idea of where it was at. There was no smoke as he came in. He turns on his IR camera and you see the fire. And, and you're like, oh man, the so lightning strike. Computers picked up the lightning strike. He used his monkey brain, sent the drone over, right? And it was lucky for it, turned on his IR camera, said, yep, this is where it's at. Now we can send teams down into the forest to be able to knock that fire out before it becomes a forest fire. So that's where I think we, we move. I think that's how it goes. That's awesome. I actually want to know more about this lightning strike. And I mean, this is adding these cameras and this whole, I mean, it's just adding more to the whole situational awareness, the whole program in a way. It's amazing adding the sense to it. Where do you see drone technology, UAV technology, UAS, like all of this, where do you see all of this evolving within the next five to 10 years? Where do you want to see, or what do you want to see? Two sides. So I don't think that we get away from pulling the drone out of the back of the, the truck. I don't think we get away from that. Not yet. Not unless we get a better low orbit transmission communication, ability to communicate better. Connectivity is a big thing. Yeah. I don't think we get to that point in five, maybe 10. I don't know. We'll see with what, what happens. So I still think that we pull... We use our monkey brains and we pull the, the drone out of the box at the back of the truck and then we operate it. I think that's still an option. That's what we get good at or we continue being better at, at doing that. But I do think the DFR piece for us, drone sense remote DSR is going to help offset a lot of that workload of guys, people taking the, the equipment off the truck. The advantage here is that it costs a lot of money to put somebody through all the schooling that we have to go through. It takes a lot of, it takes a lot of resources to do that. And so if you take me off my hose line, you take me off of a rope, you take me out of the water, that there's a cost to that, right? There's a significant cost because you have to replace me with somebody else to do that job. You gotta have, if I'm on a drone, somebody else has gotta tie the knots. They gotta be in the water. They have to do the hose line. So. You have to still do the same jobs. You're just going to have to pay somebody else to take over my position. So I think if you can get a drone to do a lot of that work by itself, then that's where it goes in five and 10 years. I think that we very quickly get to the point with regulations, which is very important. Coordination with unmanned traffic management systems, the UTM system, right? So we're all working at altitudes where we can collaborate 
between crewed and uncrewed aircraft and being able to help take the drones out of people's hands and put tools back in their hands and let them go do their jobs. I think the technology evolves to a point where we don't have to have monkey brain doesn't have to fly the drone through the building. The drone helps fly itself to the building. So if I am going to look for a bad guy in a house, maybe there's enough sensors on that aircraft to help it process its, itself as it's moving through. Certainly with the teaming aspect, we, I see that, that coming. You know, I'm, I'm imaging this, like this, you know, what an original fireman was, right? Like the leather helmet hat and maybe an ax, you know, what they were wearing and how much it's evolved and what the fireman is today and drone controller, or maybe just a red shirt, or maybe just a target employee, what this like evolution is and how much more there, there is to this whole movement forward with it. And it's really interesting. And then also, as you're saying, it's still, you know, we're not taking the man we're not taking the man out of firemen yet. Like it is like, it's still, this is the, the monkey brain, but yet the, like, we are still the, the best tool for this job, but using all this incredible technology and being part of the community to learn better and learn more of it and bringing it all together in a way. It's a, it's an amazing thing. What, what do they say when you join the, the fire department, you win the lottery? Yeah, I won the lottery. And I did. To your point, you make a great point with all the cure that hit that we were. Um, that wasn't always that way. In fact, you know, the guys, if you look at NAV, the old timers, they used to have big beards, put the beard up to brills to, to take the smoke in, right? They didn't have turnout pants. They had rubber boots if they had those. They didn't have radios. They didn't have SCBAs on their backs. All that's evolution and in pretty short order, actually. So yeah, it makes sense that robots are just a part of that evolution. This technology is just a part of that evolution. You make a great point with that. The new kit will just be part of that. And that's what our kids will grow up knowing. Beautiful. I've got one last question for you, Coit. And this is one I, I like to give everyone. And that is, as a, as a team member here at Drone Sense, what makes the most sense at Drone Sense? Community. Internal, external, the team right there. I'm just going to put that. It's community. It's really, it's, uh, so I have you as my teammate. I know I can lean on you. I've got the engineering team I can lean on. I've got my CS team I can lean on. I've got all these people, these, all this talent that I can lean on to build our community. And then our community touches the other communities, touches the, the greater group. And that group touches other groups. And that's what makes the most sense to me is building community, advancing, sharing, and, and, and serving. That's really what it all comes down to. There's a lot of places you can go work, man. There's a lot of places I could be. I want to serve. I want to serve. I want to help. I want to lift up. And that's something we do really well. I'm proud of that. You are a community leader, Coit. It's just a your subject matter expert and a wealth of knowledge. It's incredible. Coit, thanks so much for joining us today, sharing your insights. And thanks to everyone out there for tuning in to Dronecast. We'll catch you next time. Take care. Thanks. And there you have it, folks. We've reached the end of our two-part episode with Coy Kessler. We've journeyed from the early days of drones and firefighting to cutting-edge development shaping the future of emergency response. A big thank you to you, Coit, for sharing your wealth of knowledge and expertise with us. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. This is Joe Kearns, signing off from Dronecast, rethinking public safety one drone at a time. Until next time, keep looking to the skies. You might just see the future of public safety flying by. Dronecast, rethinking public safety one drone at a time is brought to you by DroneSense. To find out more about DroneSense and how our comprehensive situational awareness platform can help you fly, share, and manage your drone program, please visit DroneSense.com. That's D-R-O-N-E-S-E-N-S-E.com. And then make sure to search for DroneCast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else that podcasts are found. Please don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at DroneSense, thanks for listening.